He is one of the world's influential Muslims, the spiritual leader of 20 million Ismailis, friend of prime ministers and presidents, and someone who rarely shies away from dealing with the issues that confront the world, whether they concern conflict, development, or religion. This week, to talk about all of them, he's our guest. Hello, I'm Peter Mansbridge, one-on-one -on -one today with His Highness, the Aga Khan. You must love Canada. You keep coming back here. I do. What is the quality that you most admire about this country? I think uh, a number of qualities. Uh, first of all, a pluralist society that has invested in building pluralism where communities from all different backgrounds, faiths, are happy. Uh, a modern country that deals with modern issues and uh, not running away from them, dealing with the tough ones, and a global commitment to values, to Canadian values, which I think are very important. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because I, I wonder whether your confidence in Canada on a lot of what you just said has in any way been, you know, shattered a little bit in these past few years, especially since 9-11. There have been tensions in this country as there have been in many other Western countries yeah. between the Muslim and the non-Muslim yeah. societies on any number of levels on both sides about yeah. history and religion and tradition and and integration within society. Yeah. How much has that concerned you? Well it concerns me and at the same time it doesn't in the sense that to me building and sustaining a pluralist society is always going to be a work in progress. That it, it doesn't have a finite end and uh, so long as there is national intent, civic intent to make pluralism work, uh, then one accepts that it's a work in progress. Let me go a little deeper on that because it, it raises a question you have often raised and that's the, the issue of ignorance. Um, you reject the theory of a clash of civilizations or even a clash of religions. You believe there's a, a clash of ignorance here on both sides of that divide. And you felt that way for a long time. I, I was looking through the, the transcripts of an interview you gave in the 1980s in Canada where you were warning the West that it had to do a better job in trying to understand Islam. That clearly hasn't happened. No. It hasn't happened, and uh, a, a number of, of, of friends and people in important places have tried to contribute to solving that problem, but it's a long-established problem, and it's going to take, I think, several decades before we reach a situation where the definition of an educated person includes basic understanding of the Islamic world. And that hasn't been the case. And the absence of that basic education has caused all sorts of misunderstandings, but above all, the inability to predict statehood, international affairs, economic affairs, are often predicated on the ability to predict. If you don't know the issues of the forces at play, the ability to predict is uh, severely constrained. What's been the resistance, do you think? I think essentially historic. Uh, I think that uh, the Judeo-Christian societies have developed their own education over decades and more. And basic knowledge on the Islamic world uh, has simply been absent. And if you look at what was required education in the 80s, for example, I was a student in, in the US. Uh, basic education on the Islamic world was absent, even on general courses on the humanities, for example. Is this a, a one-sided clash of ignorance? I mean... No, I, I, I think uh, there's ignorance on both sides, and I think very often there's confusion. I think more and more there's been confusion between, for example, religion and civilization. And uh, that's, that's uh, introducing instability in the discussion, frankly. I would prefer to talk about ignorance on the civilizations of the Islamic world 
rather than ignorance just on the faith of Islam. What we've witnessed in the last couple of years, not just in this country, but in other Western countries as well, is what we call homegrown terror, right. where you see young Muslim men, educated, born in the West, educated in the West, who are moving towards you know, a fundamentalist view, a militant view of Islam. Why is that happening? Well, there is, a, a, without any doubt, a growing sense amongst Muslim communities around the world that there are forces at play that it doesn't control, but which does view the Muslim world uh, with, let's say, unhappiness or more. I would simply say, however, that if you analyze the situation, I don't think you can conclude that all Muslims from all backgrounds are part of that, of that phenomenon. Secondly, if you go back and look at that, you will find that a lot of the causes of those communities are people where there's a long-standing, unresolved political crisis. You, it, it's very, very risky, I think, to interpret these situations as being specific to the faith of Islam. It is specific to peoples, sometimes ethnic groups, but it's not specific to the faith of Islam. Well, that must really concern you. Your, your followers uh, believe in you, see you as a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, the same Prophet that some of these minority fundamentalist militant groups hold up and claim as the reason they're doing the acts they're doing? Uh, again, I think when one has to go back and say, what is the cause of this situation? With all due respect, if you look at the crisis in the Middle East, uh, that crisis was born at the end of the First World War. The crisis in Kashmir was born through the freedom of the Indian continent. These are political issues originally, they're not religious issues. You can't attribute the faith of Islam to them. I think the second point I would make is this tendency to generalize Islam. There are many different interpretations of Islam. As a Muslim, if I said to you, that I didn't recognize the difference between a Greek Orthodox or a Russian Orthodox or a Protestant or a Catholic, I think you'd say to me, but you don't understand the Christian world. Well, let me reverse that question. I hear you. Um, there are a couple of areas we want to talk about. We're going to have to take a break, but those are and include um, your belief in Canada as a home of pluralism and your belief to the point where you're establishing your foundation's global center for pluralism here. And also Afghanistan, where both Canada and you share a concern. And I want to talk about that next when we uh, return one on one with the Aga Khan right after this. You're watching CBC News World, Canada's news network. From this day forward, Olay Anti-Aging Moisturizers will forever be redefined. New Olay Definity. It reduces the look of discolorations, brown spots, and wrinkles for highly defined luminosity. New Olay Definity. My souvenir from this trip? Back pain. Went from bad to worse. But now I wear this Thermacare heat wrap for eight hours of heat and up to 16 more hours of relief. 16 hours. I could use these every day. Thermacare. Have heat, will travel. Are savings an endangered species? Most banks pay peanuts for your savings, but try to make you spend. That's how they make money. But how do you make money? With the ING Direct Investment Savings Account, your savings make it for you. Paying high interest every day on every dollar, with no fees to eat away at your money. Your savings prosper. Proving that while being big cannot guarantee survival, being smart can. Call. Save your money. Every day. 
Lexmark printers go to work for some of the world's most important companies. In fact, 75% of the top banks, retailers, and pharmacies use Lexmark. And now, that same performance can work for your home, too. Introducing Lexmark's new all-in-one. With professional features and the protection